I want to talk about some of the common obstacles because um, in one way what I'm talking about is really simple. Eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full. Like I said earlier, babies are born knowing how to do it. But it's not easy because these patterns develop over years, right? Years and years. And they're very complicated. There's a lot of emotional input. There's, um, you know, all the years of dieting and restriction. So, and I think about like, um, well, I'll, I'll use that example later. So one of, one of the biggest obstacles is judgment, good, bad thinking. It's very hard after being trained to see certain foods as good and bad to start, to start thinking a cookie is okay um, or that a piece of pizza is okay. And so we want to um, help people just really work again, like I said, on being present, on noticing if a food satisfies them. So I would mentioned earlier the woman who woke up every day. Is it going to be a good day or a bad day based on what she ate? And she had done a really wonderful job working her way through this, um, but found that even though she'd made peace with just about every food, donuts got her. Um, her husband had an organization where sometimes there'd be leftover donuts and he'd bring them home, and she'd find herself eating way more donuts than made her body feel comfortable, and she couldn't figure it out. And it just turned out, deep down, she thought donuts were evil. They were just evil. And so she really had never, she didn't um, allow herself to have them and um, she, when she realized it, she then began, you know, it wasn't even that often, but when she got a craving for a donut, she would have one. So it helped take away that sense that um, they were something special because they were glittering still when she brought them in. Not having food available, it's really interesting when you work with people who say, I'm an overeater, I love food, and you start to ask them, well, what do you have at home? What, if I came over, what's in your cabinets? What's in your refrigerator? Often there's not very much some eggs, some juice, maybe some spoiled lunch meat. And you know, you think about it, like you come home after a hard day of work, if there's no food in the house, it, makes, it should make you anxious. It makes us anxious. Versus when there's food there, foods that nourish us, foods we enjoy. So this guy I was working with, um, he, he, he was single, he lived alone, he didn't really know much about cooking. And every day on his way home from work, he stopped at the 7-Eleven and he just grabbed something, including a box of cookies, which would be gone by the time he got home. So our work together um, was to start for, for him to start to figure out what kinds of foods he truly enjoyed, um, what he could do easily, because he really wasn't very interested in learning to cook. So there was a grocery store near, near him that sold some pre-prepared things, some nice you know, salad-y kind of things. And he started buying them, including the cookies, bringing them in his house so that he didn't even have to go by the 7-Eleven on his way home. He could go home and what he needed was there. People develop habitual patterns, like maybe you're somebody who likes to go to the movie and have popcorn. Or maybe um, somebody who it's very common to eat in front of the TV, right? So let's say that you're somebody or your client is someone who likes to eat popcorn when they go to the movies. Um, so what do you do? You're going to a movie at, say, 5 o'clock and then going out for dinner. What do you do about the popcorn? That's dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, you might decide that's what you want for dinner, and you'll see if you're hungry afterwards, and if not, you're okay with that. What else might you do? You might say, I'm going to have some but only enough so I know that I'll still be hungry when the movie's over and get a smaller size. And sometimes to do that, you might do what we call arranging your hunger. And this is something people do when they get more, you know, when they've collected more experiences and they're more comfortable with the attuned eating. Um, I know I'm going to a movie at four and I want to be hungry for popcorn, so when I eat my lunch at one, I'm going to eat to being somewhat full. But I don't want to get full because I know I want to be hungry again when I get to the theater. You see what I mean? You can kind of be in charge of that, of how that goes for you. Um, and, and maybe you decide sometimes that you don't have to have the popcorn, that it just became connected. But there's no reason you don't have to. What somebody who eats in front of the TV all the time, that's a tough one to break. So I think of like in, in Chicago in the winter when we have a lot of snow, and if you have a driveway, you, you back up, you, you create a rut, right? And that's like our neural pathway of eating TV. They just go together, things that fire together, wire together. And so you have to make a conscious effort to 
make another pathway. Um, I remember one person I work with always you know, got the food as she sat down in front of the TV. And what she decided to create that other pathway was that she was going to um, sit in a different place in her, in her den. And also that when she sat down, she was going to light a candle because that was just really calming to her. Is it okay to ever eat in front of the TV? Well, we talked about mindful eating. And mindfulness means bringing your attention and your awareness to the eating experience. So watching TV, we know a lot of people do a lot of mindless eating in front of the TV. But I want to I wanna look at a few different scenarios around this. Let's start with somebody who actually is, a, is an intuitive, mindful eater and pretty connected with themselves. And there happens to be a show and they really want to watch and they feel like watching it while they eat. It is possible to stay connected to yourself while the TV is on. And you know, if you think about it, like you often eat, you're not always eating by yourself. You're eating with other people. You're talking. You might go out to lunch with somebody today. Um, you can still check in every so often. How is my body feeling? Even while you're doing something else. On the other hand, if you have clients who are really disconnected and being, watching TV or being on the computer you know, there's just no way that they're connecting with themselves. It is helpful to, ha to encourage them to try to sit at a table without the distractions. At the same time, for some people, especially like our binge eaters who are using food to numb, um, that quiet can be really terrifying. Some people really can't tolerate. So just be mindful of that too. For some people, they actually might need the distractions in the beginning. So what I, all of this goes to say, there are no rules around this. There are guidelines, and you have to work with each of your clients around what their needs are. Psychological factors. So, you know, in the beginning when I do this work with people, it's really concrete. And those of you who are dietitians are probably doing the same thing, helping people recognize hunger, make matches, notice their fullness. But like I said, just because it's simple, it's not easy, and people get stuck at various places down the road. And our job is to help them figure out what those obstacles are and that they often are psychological. So I want to give you a couple examples of what I mean. Um, if you're going to feed yourself what you're hungry for when you're hungry, you need to have food fairly easily available. So if you're going to work for a full day, if you're going to be at an office for eight hours, um, you need to have something with you. You may say, well, I'm going to go out for lunch, and maybe you will, but most people have that happen where all of a sudden something comes up and you can't get out, and so you make do with what other people's stuff they've put out, the candy people have put out, or you end up at a vending machine. Um, plus, you might get hungry before lunch. What if you get hungry before lunchtime? Are you going to overeat before you leave so you don't get hungry till lunch? It's a long time to go. So think about taking a food bag. Think about helping your clients figure out how to keep food with them so when they're hungry, they have what they need. They're not obligated to eat from, but it's like a security blanket. Like, if you have ever been with young kids or if you've had young kids of your own and you have, say, a two-year-old, you would never say to your two-year-old, well, we'll be home in five hours, just wait. <laughs> you know, they'll be miserable and you'll be miserable. So you pack up the grapes and the fish crackers and whatever, the Cheerios and the apple juice. Take care of yourselves that way. Help your clients take care of themselves that way. So this one woman I was working with repeatedly went to work without anything for herself and got too hungry and ended up binging later in the day. And when we explored it, you know, she was making lunch every day for her kids and her husband, but not for herself. And so what, what we learned is that um, she grew up with a very depressed mom, and her mom really wasn't there to help her with that, not only to help her, but because this, this client was the oldest of her siblings, she was the one who made meals for the, for, for the family. And she, first of all, she didn't want to do it anymore, but even deeper than that, she really had a longing for someone to come and take care of her. She was hoping that somebody would finally show up and do this for her. And doing it for herself meant letting go of that longing, letting go of the fantasy that one day her mom would be in a position to take care of her. She ended up talking with her husband about it, sharing with him, and he, had, um, they decide, he, he became collaborative with her in making the, the lunches for everybody, and so she was able to do that. Another client um, got stuck at the very beginning. This is less common that I see, but even just allowing herself to be hungry was dangerous. Again, growing up in a family where um, you weren't not allowed to have needs, and hunger is a need, and being hungry got very scary for her. So um, 
you know, when I work, I, I was seeing her in a group, and when I work with people in a group, I refer them back to their individual therapist when they have one for the, more, for the deeper psychological stuff. And she ended up doing some work with that. But of course, one of the things I talk with her about is that nobody knows your need. Like, nobody can tell when you're hungry or not. It's a private need. And, you know, she's in, in charge now. And she was eventually able to, to listen to her body around that.